Good morning. In today's headline, North Carolina lawmakers override Democrat Governor Roy Cooper's veto on abortion. They passed a new law with stricter rules. The president holds a second closed-door meeting on the nation's $31 trillion debt ceiling. Will the two sides find common ground before default? We speak to an expert. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis is sending troops to Texas to, to help defend the border. And New York City Mayor Eric Adams says his city might start housing illegal immigrants on public school property. The CEO of OpenAI, the company behind ChatGPT, testifies before a Senate subcommittee. We share his and lawmakers' top concerns around AI technology. And ahead of the Memorial Day weekend, what are some easy adjustments you can make to save money on your trip? Good morning and welcome to NTD. I'm Tiffany Meyer, in for Kevin Hogan. Good morning, everyone. I'm Evelyn Lee. Today is Wednesday, May 17th. Memorial Day weekend is approach. Are you going anywhere? I am not. No plans yet. Do you have plans? Uh, no, maybe, maybe you can make it a deep beach day or something. Who knows? <laughs> I don't plan fun. that far ahead. <laughs> All right, but first we need to get to, uh, to some more serious news because in a little over two weeks, the nation faces a deadline to raise its $31 trillion debt ceiling to avoid the economic consequences of the default. At the White House yesterday, the president met with congressional leaders to discuss how to move forward. And today's Melina Weisskopf is at the White House with more. Melina, following the second meeting, how are these discussions looking? Hi, Evelyn. Both parties appeared optimistic when they spoke to us following that meeting. They say they made progress. As for where that progress lies, the two sides have a different outlook on this. For House Speaker Kevin McCarthy, he says the key for him was that they were able to narrow down who's sitting at the negotiating table. His take is that the two sides are still far apart on a deal, but a deal is in sight. Whereas Senate Leader Chuck Schumer says the key takeaway for him was that there was an overall consensus that compromise is needed. It is possible to get a deal by the end of the week. It's not that difficult to get to an agreement. What has changed in this meeting is the president changed the scope of who's all negotiating. It was a much more cordial meeting. There were honest and real discussions about differences that we have on a whole variety of issues. But it was all respectful, and that was a good sign as well. This meeting comes after both White House and congressional staffers have met several times to try to find that common ground, but the White House has adamantly opposed categorizing these meetings as negotiations, as they want to be careful not to be seen as caving to GOP demands. We are right now having a conversation negotiating on the budget. That's what the president has been very clear about. We want to go back to regular order and talk about appropriations. Now, as for specifics, what we're watching is where the two parties stand on certain aspects like strengthening work requirements for people to receive social welfare benefits, as well as rescinding unspent COVID money. I asked both parties about this following that meeting. Speaker McCarthy says he's confident that taking back that unspent COVID money will make it into that final deal, whereas Senate Leader Chuck Schumer tells me he'd rather not talk specifics. Yeah, we're not going to get into negotiations out here. We have to come to common ground. It's a no-brainer. I don't think anybody in America doesn't think if you had billions of dollars sitting out there that you appropriated two years ago, people could not spend. And as the clock is ticking to get this done, some House Republicans have sent a letter to the Senate urging them to stay in session next week and skip their recess so that both chambers could quickly pass something should a deal be reached soon. President Biden has recently expressed optimism that a deal will be reached to avoid a default, and McCarthy says he's prepared to continue these negotiation talks. Evelyn, back to you. Thanks, Melina, for the report. Now, President Joe Biden is canceling part of his upcoming foreign trip amid the debt ceiling negotiations. He is traveling to Japan today as part of what was supposed to be a week-long trip through the Pacific region. Australian Prime Minister Anthony Albanese has ruled out a Quad summit taking place in Sydney without Biden, saying the four leaders will talk at the Group of Seven meeting in uh, this weekend in Japan. And joining us now, we bring in Vance Ginn, president of Ginn Economic Consulting, to give an analysis on the debt limit. Vance, good morning. Good to have you here. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be with you. 
Now, it seems both sides say they don't want a default. There's about two weeks till the government reportedly runs out of money. How likely are we to see a default? I don't think we'll end up seeing a default at the end of the day. I mean, we are in a dire situation to where we've spent so much money and, and run up the massive debt that we have. That we have net payments just on the interest alone it is about a trillion dollars a year. It's a massive amount of money. And so the, the Treasury is running out of revenue is kind of the issue here to pay off of our debt as it rolls over, which could lead to a default, which just means higher interest rates, higher inflation, um, a deeper economic recession. This is something that we shouldn't hit. And at the end of the day, Biden and the Senate Democrats should go along with what the House Republicans have already passed. They've passed a good bill. Let's get something done. And Vance, on that note, you wrote on Twitter recently, this isn't a tax revenue problem. This is a government spending problem. What's the solution here? That's exactly right. We never have a revenue problem, a tax revenue problem. It's always a spending problem. If revenue goes down, then you should spend less. It's the taxpayer's money. The government doesn't have money at the end of the day. And so they should go in and say, look, we need to cut spending. That's what the House Republicans have done. They went from the 2023 levels down to 2022 levels. So that is a reduction in government spending at the end of the day. And they've limited spending growth over time to 1% over the next decade, year over year. And so I think these are good steps in the right direction, along with getting rid of bad policies of this green energy agenda, which makes us poor and, and, and causes more problems in the markets than otherwise. Well, we really need a pro-growth policy, which is less government spending, lower taxes and less regulation. And Vance, while these talks continue, what's the economic fallout on Americans? You know, there's there's a lot at stake here. If we went into default, we would see soaring interest rates, which we're already seeing higher interest rates now, mortgage rates going around 7%, car loan rates going up as well. We would see much higher rates because it would be more costly for us to pay for our debt. And this has an effect also on what the Federal Reserve does with their interest rates and with their inf and the amount of money they put in the economy, which would create more inflation. We're already being hit by inflation. It's one thing after another from this Biden administration, their big government policies. We've got to get back to saneness. Right now, we're passing irresponsible budgets. We need responsible budgeting, responsible um, sort of policies overall. And, and at the end of the day, the Biden administration again and the Senate Democrats have got to come together with the House Republicans, pass a good deal so that way we don't exceed and break or bust the, spend, the overall debt ceiling cap that we have in place. Lots at stake here, Van Skin. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. North Carolina lawmakers banned most abortions after 12 weeks of pregnancy yesterday. The House and Senate both voted to override the veto of Democratic Governor Roy Cooper. Shouts of shame, shame were reportedly heard on the House floor after the vote. The legislation outlaws most abortions after the 12-week mark but would make special exemptions for complex cases, such as when the life of the mother is at risk. Abortion is currently legal in the state up to 20 weeks. The new 12-week law takes effect on July 1st. North Carolina's lawmakers originally had no chance of passing any abortion ban with Governor Cooper vowing to veto any such move, but that all changed in April when a lawmaker left the Democrats and joined the Republican Party. Republicans then had the votes necessary to override the governor. Cooper has made repeated appeals to Republicans in the state not to support the legislation. Here's Cooper speaking to supporters. This bill has nothing to do with making women safer and everything to do with banning abortion. How about leave the medicine to the doctors and the decisions to the women? White House Press Secretary Karine Jean-Pierre criticized North Carolina lawmakers. She called the law dangerous and out of touch with the majority of North Carolinians. The U.S. Secret Service is investigating after an intruder made his way into the home of President Biden's national security advisor. The incident happened last month when a man entered the home of Jake Sullivan in the middle of the night. The man, who appeared to be intoxicated, was confronted by Sullivan. Agents who are stationed round the clock outside Sullivan's home were reportedly unaware of the intruder. Sullivan was not harmed during the breach. The White House declined to comment. Officials are investigating whether the intrusion was an accident or if the intruder had criminal intent. However, the incident raises questions about the Secret Service and their abilities. A spokesman told the Washington Post they are investigating for any deviation in protocol. The agency said additional security precautions for Sullivan have been deployed. 
Florida is sending troops to Texas to help defend the southern border. Governor Ron DeSantis announced the move yesterday. Roughly 800 members of the Florida National Guard will be sent, along with 200 state law enforcement agents and 100 highway patrol troopers. Florida is also sending drones, airboats and aircraft to deal with the border crisis. A federal judge ordered a preliminary injunction of the Biden administration's parole with conditions policy yesterday. It would have allowed federal authorities to release illegal immigrants into the country without a court date. The judge put a temporary hold on the policy last week. He found Florida would suffer irreparable harm without the injunction. The migrant crisis is spreading beyond the southern border. New York City Mayor Eric Adams said the city may begin housing illegal immigrants on public school property. This comes as New York City struggles to manage the thousands of immigrants being bused to the city. And it's Jason Perry reports. I'm here in New York City right outside of this gym, which is on public school property, and it could soon be home to illegal immigrants. Parents protested in this same area early on Tuesday. They were upset that it's so close to the school their children attend. So we talked to some of the parents and some students about how they feel about that situation. Gyms are for children. Look, it's going to be what it is. All the protesting, everything that's going on, it's falling on deaf ears, you know, that's, that's my opinion. As long as the kids, are, what's gonna happen? A, a, a child is gonna get hurt, because we don't know who's coming in here from other countries, gang members, any, anybody. It takes away from her prom, her graduation, the carnival, and at this point, it's not that we don't want them here, it just shouldn't be on school grounds. That's our main concern right now. And this is what the students had to say. Ms. Masulo, our principal, told us that we weren't going to be able to use the gym because of what's going on. Okay, yeah, they're not going to have prom and stuff, but think about the people in there. Like, you don't know how they're living because you aren't you you aren't from where they're from. Just knowing that I could I could take a little bit of what I have and give to them, that means a lot. Meanwhile, New York City Mayor Eric Adams said on PIX11 that the city has to bring the immigrants in and then find space. Now, we want to be clear on that plan. We have 20 standalone gymnasiums throughout the, the city. They stand alone. They're not a, a part of the school building. They are on the list of potential locations that we may have to use. We're not there yet. Adam said on PIX11 that New York City received over 4,200 illegal immigrants in the last week, and they could receive 15 more busloads over the weekend. He said the city has to be prepared to manage the crisis. Jason Perry, NTD News, New York. Still to come, a leaked report from the Pentagon raises questions on what the government knew about the natural origin theory of COVID-19. And the CIA posts a video online to recruit Russian spies. We go over the recruitment video and the Kremlin's response to it. Those stories after the break. Welcome back. House Republicans have set a date for Special Counsel John Durham to testify before a committee. That will be next Thursday. Durham will be asked to summarize his report in an opening statement and answer questions. NTD's Jeremy Sandberg has more on Durham's report, as well as a reaction to it from presidential candidate Vivek Ramaswamy. Durham's report concluded the FBI rushed to open an investigation into former President Trump in 2016 without a genuine belief or evidence of probable cause, and that the premise of the probe was a departure from how the agency treated other politically sensitive investigations at the time. The report highlighted the FBI's handling of former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton's unauthorized use of a private email server to transmit top-secret government emails. It noted the FBI and Justice Department restricted an inquiry into the Clinton Foundation so that little to no investigative activity could take place in the months leading up to the presidential election, a stark contrast to the handling of the Trump investigation. Many Republicans see it as a weaponization of federal law enforcement agencies for political means. 2024 presidential candidate Vivek Ramaswamy spoke with Jan Yakelik, senior editor of the Epoch Times and host of American Thought Leaders. Ramaswamy says alleged FBI corruption is not a partisan issue. This is a rules of the road issue that when you have a managerial class that actually runs the show, it drains the lifeblood 
out of the three branch system of constitutional self governance that set this whole American ball game into motion. He says he's willing to shut the FBI down if elected president. If you still have a fourth branch of government that wields all the power, you have one answer left. You shut it down. The GOP candidate says the most important part of Durham's report is the fact that the FBI knew there was no basis for the investigation in the first place, but launched its probe anyway. While many Republicans see it as a form of election interference, Ramaswamy uses a different term to be more precise. I'd call it a form of a bureaucratic coup, actually, because this is about taking the legs out from the democratically elected leader of the executive branch and his ability to govern after the election, right? Ramaswamy says the root cause of corruption runs deep and feels it's his duty to the next generation to run for president to address a loss of national civic identity and values like the rule of law. Jeremy Sandberg, NTD News. You can watch the full interview with Ramaswamy and American Thought Leaders on Epoch TV. It premieres this morning at 9.30 a.m. Eastern Time. A leaked report from the Pentagon is shedding light on how the agency dealt with the debate over the origins of COVID-19. The May 2020 report dismantles the natural origin study led by Dr. Anthony Fauci. A working paper by researchers at the Department of Defense was leaked to the public on Monday. It's called Critical Analysis of Anderson et al., the proximal origin of SARS-CoV-2. The paper is dated May 26, 2020. The report forensically dismantles the proximal origin study. Dr. Anthony Fauci prompted that study and used it to argue that the COVID-19 virus had come from nature and not from a lab in Wuhan, China. Here's Fauci at a White House press briefing in April 2020. There was a study uh, recently that we can make available to you where a, a group of highly qualified evolutionary virologists looked at the sequences there and the sequences in uh, bats as they evolve and the mutations that it took to get to the point where it is now is totally consistent with a jump of a species from an animal to a human. Commander Jean-Paul Chrétien, a Navy doctor working at the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, and Dr. Robert Cutlip, a research scientist at the Defense Intelligence Agency, authored the Pentagon report. They concluded the natural origin case made in proximal origin are based not on scientific analysis, but on unwarranted assumptions. The existence of this internal Pentagon paper is crucial. An Epoch Times analysis says it proves government officials were aware in the early months of the pandemic there was no evidence in support of a natural origin theory. Proximal origin was the media's go-to authority for the natural origin theory. It also became the most read article on COVID-19 and one of the most cited academic papers of all time. The CEO of OpenAI, the company that created ChatGPT, is admitting fears that AI technology could go wrong. He appeared at a Senate subcommittee hearing on AI technology. Here's the story. My worst fears. OpenAI CEO Sam Altman told the Senate Judiciary Subcommittee on Tuesday his biggest fear is the AI technology industry creating significant harm to the world. He noted that the technology could be used to generate misinformation and interfere with elections. I think if this technology goes wrong, it can go quite wrong, uh, and we want to be vocal about that. We want to work with the government to prevent that from happening, but we, we try to be very clear-eyed about what the downside case is and the work that we have to do to mitigate that. Altman says AI models are increasingly powerful and need government oversight to regulate ethical and safety risks. But he says AI companies will still have to take responsibility for such safeguards with or without government intervention. We think that regulatory intervention by governments will be critical to mitigate the risks of increasingly powerful models. For example, the U.S. government might consider a combination of licensing and testing requirements for development and release of AI models above a threshold of capabilities. The OpenAI CEO says he is willing to partner with the government to ensure that the most powerful AI models adhere to a set of safety requirements. What? During the hearing, top Democratic senator on the subcommittee, Richard Blumenthal, said one of his worries is job loss. The top Republican senator on the subcommittee, Josh Hawley, raised concerns that the technology could potentially be used to generate false information in elections. The CIA has posted a slickly produced cinematic recruitment video online to recruit Russian spies. Intelligence officials say the war in Ukraine has produced an opportunity to collect valuable information about the country. 
NTD's Daniel Monahan has more on the video. The spy agency believes Russians disaffected by the war could be convinced to share their secrets. The push includes a new CIA channel on Telegram, the social media network that is a popular source of unfiltered news in Russia. In the video, a male narrator reflects on the meaning of heroism and endurance. Individual people are seen weighing their decisions, a man trudging through snow, a woman staring through a window. At the end, a man and a woman are shown in separate scenes with their fingers hovering over phone screens with a link saying, contact CIA. The narrator then says, this is my Russia. This will always be my Russia. I will endure. My family will endure. We will live with dignity because of my actions. The video concludes with instructions on how to get in touch with America's top spy agency anonymously and securely. It also contains text saying the CIA is looking to hear from military officers, intelligence specialists, diplomats, and scientists, and people with information about Russia's economy and leadership. A Kremlin spokesman says he is sure Russia's intelligence officials are monitoring the situation, adding that Russia is fully aware of the CIA's level of activity in its territory. Daniel Monahan, NTD News. Coming up, Memorial Day is fast approaching and with it, the unofficial start of summer. What are some easy adjustments you can make to save money on your next trip? Welcome back. Summer is right around the corner and I bet many of you can't wait to get out of the house, but times are tough. So what are some easy adjustments you can make to save money? I spoke to an expert who had some great advice. Joining me now is personal finance expert, Professor Daniel Ricardo. He is also a finance professor at the University of San Diego. It's good to have you. Daniel, please give us your top three money saving tips for people who are about to go on a trip. Yeah, well, it's going to be a tough year this year because of inflation and because of the crowds. Number one, look for those discounts. Uh, don't leave home without your AAA card, your Groupon app, your student ID, your military ID. Those sorts of things can score you pretty good discounts, not just at hotels, but also at restaurants. And that's important. Um, don't forget the what I like to call the happy hour, the versus the dinner hour. I have four kids. They eat like linebackers. So check out happy hour where you can kind of save a little bit of money versus the sort of the full blown dinner uh, that might help as well. And one of my best suggestions is bundle your airfare, hotel and meals together. Uh, that can often save you a lot of money. So for example, if your hotel includes breakfast, that can save a family of four upwards about a hundred bucks. So uh, you might want to check that one out. Hmm, that's Excellent, excellent um, tips. So there are always these unplanned expenses though. So any advices on how to approach daily budget planning and then really stick to it? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. So one of the things I'm telling folks this summer is flexibility is key. So as you said, there's gonna be all sorts of little hiccups that, that pop up uh, pl planning and executing a family vacation. But if you're flexible, flexible dates, flexible locations, those sorts of things, you will save money and stress. So maybe less Vegas, more Branson this year. I don't know. That might be a, that might be a suggested topic. Um, use, if you can, those travel awards that you've been accumulating. So on your credit card, maybe you've accumulated some cash back or some points. Now's the time maybe to cash them in. And if you're not familiar with apps, ask your kids, your teenagers, they probably are. Apps like Skyscanner uh, can save you a lot of money and a lot of stress, perhaps, when it comes to planning out a late summer trip when we're flying outside of the U.S., so is it better to exchange money in the destination country or should we just do it at home? Great question. That's good news, bad news there. So the good news is the dollar is really strong right now vis-a-vis uh, -vis most currencies, so you can stretch that dollar further. What I counsel folks to do is change a little bit of cash at the airport, not too much, maybe 50 bucks, 100 bucks, basically enough just to kind of get you to where you're going to be, your hotel that sort of thing. And then when you get in country, you want to find a large bank, use that bank because they'll probably get a better rate. And if not, try the ATM machine because you'll probably get a decent rate from the ATM machine using your debit card. Beware, some debit cards will charge you a transaction fee, a foreign transaction fee. So you want to find that out before you get on the plane to your destination. All right. No more bad surprises in our bank accounts this year. Thank you so much, Professor Dan Ricardo. I appreciate it.
Thanks, Evelyn. Take care. Nice. You know, I actually always wondered about this money exchanging thing, and I've gotten in a few arguments about it as well, so now we can settle it once and for all. <laughs> there we go. Actually, all these tips really makes me want to plan a trip. <laughs> but you, yeah, you know what? Getting out of the city, honestly, is always a good idea. <laughs> Indeed. We can dream. <laughs> yes. All right. That's all for today's program. We'd love to hear from you. You can share your thoughts and your story at goodmorning at ntd.com. Shoot us an email if you'd like. Thanks for watching. I'm Evelyn Lee. And I'm Tiffany Meyer.